Welcome everyone. On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Wyatt Technology Corp., I'd like to welcome you to Optimizing Protein Biotherapeutic Formulations with the Light Scattering Toolkit. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'll be the host and moderator for today's event. I'd like to introduce our presenter for today. He is Daniel Sohm, PhD, Principal Scientist and Director of Marketing for Wyatt Technology Corp. Welcome, Dr. Sohm. The presenter ball is yours. Well, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thanks for that introduction, and welcome everyone out there in Internet land. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today. And what I'll be talking about will be how the various tools that utilize uh, light scattering technology for characterizing various types of biologics and other biotherapeutics can be used in the formulation regime to optimize formulations. Just to jump right into it, in the course of formulating your products, you encounter various questions that need to be answered along the way. For instance, are your products well behaved? You need to screen various conditions of the formulation in order to select the most promising. And the ways in which light scattering can assist you in doing that include assessing aggregation, propensity for aggregation, thermal and colloidal stability, as well as viscosity, which is sometimes of interest for highly concentrated monoclonal antibodies. Next thing you'd like to ask is, is it a robust product? And once you've gone through that screening, you've identified the few optimal conditions which seem to be relatively well behaved, you're going to test several of those for accelerated stress studies and shelf life stability studies, at which point you'll probably be extracting aliquots of sample at various time points, and you'd like to assess them for their degradation. And the ways in which light scattering helps with that includes uh, measuring molecular weight, aggregates, identifying fragments, subtle modifications that might be reflected in charge or the way that molecules interact. And then finally, or perhaps not finally, but uh, at the beginning of a, a new cycle formulation or summer after you've looked at various formulations, you really want to understand why the formulations are doing what they're doing, what is the impact of the different excipients, the different buffer conditions. And again, light scattering can help you out here by analyzing the interactions between the product and excipient or between co-solutes, for instance, if you have a, uh, a cocktail of proteins, as well as looking at the self-association of those proteins under different conditions and better understanding what they're doing. Now, I'll be speaking about proteins in many of the examples that I present, but I'd just like to state up front that many of the same questions and analytical uh, challenges arise in the context of virus-like particles, uh, viruses, peptides, and other types of biotherapeutics. And light scattering really can address all these. Uh, these instruments are used in optimizing all formulations of all those types of products. And so it is relevant to all of them. So what can light scattering measure? There are various types of light scattering, actually. There's more than one. The first type is static light scattering, which is also known as multi-angle light scattering, or MALS. And I'll generally be referring to it as MALS. And MALS has the property that it, it can determine molecular weight from first principles, which is really important in that you don't have to know ahead of time what you're looking for. You don't have to uh, calibrate columns. It really gives you that answer without too many guesses. Another property of the molecule that it can give you is the radius of gyration, or root mean square radius, as long as that dimension is larger than about 10 nanometers. Once you have those, you can derive some uh, additional properties of the molecules in the solution through various types of uh, measurements. For instance, how does the apparent molecular weight or size change with concentration? And those will give you the second coefficient, which is a measure of nonspecific interactions. And you can also characterize higher order interactions, for instance, determine the KD of self-association. And for cosolutes, you can determine a measure of nonspecific interactions known as the cross viral coefficients. We'll see how that's done. Second type of light scattering is dynamic light scattering, uh, which directly measures the translational diffusion coefficient of the molecules in the solution, uh, from which we can determine the hydrodynamic radius. And through concentration dependence, we can also derive a measure of the interactions known as the diffusion interaction parameter. It's often called KD in the literature, but in order not to confuse with the other KD, I'll be calling it D1. Third type of light scattering that's used to analyze uh, these uh, biomolecules is phase analysis light scattering, uh, 
through the measurement of electrophoretic mobility, which can be converted to zeta potential, uh, effective molecular charge. And one of the nice things about uh, PALS is that you can measure the eyes electric point in your formulation buffers. Uh, you don't have to go through other matrices or, or other types of environments that might impact PI, and so you can get a, a direct measurement of PI. Now, I won't be delving too deeply into the basics behind these various techniques. If you'd like to learn more, I invite you to visit our website uh, under Theory, Webinars, or Solutions to learn more about the basics of light scattering and, and the instrumentation. So getting back to formulations, uh, our first challenge is screening formulation matrices, or perhaps you're in pre-formulation space, or you might even be looking at various candidates to determine which are most developable. And really, the the most powerful tool out there, probably, for this type of uh, measurement is high-throughput dynamic light scattering. As I'll show you in the course of this webinar, there are many properties indicating um, uh, degradation and propensity for degradation that you can determine with this instrument in the high-throughput screening mode. This instrument, the, Dy the Dynaproplate Reader 2, is unique in that it performs dynamic light scattering directly in micro wall plates without any additional fluid handling. And so you can run through hundreds of different conditions. You can run through temperature ramps to assess uh, conformational stability. And it is a non-diluting technique, as opposed to, for instance, science exclusion chromatography, where uh, dilution can have an impact on the properties. This is, in fact, a non-diluting technique. The properties that are measured by dynamic light scattering include distribution of aggregates from 0.5 to up to 1,000 nanometers in radius, a colloidal stability, unfolding temperature of a molecule, TM, the temperature for the onset of aggregation. Um, you can also characterize chemical denaturation. Uh, we'll see an example of that. And finally, you can characterize the viscosity of your solution, which, of course, uh, is important for uh, highly concentrated proteins in order to assess um, injectability and, pro and processing down the line. Very briefly on how dynamic light scattering works. Dynamic light scattering measures the rapid fluctuations in the light intensity due to the Brownian motion of particles in solution. Um, the rate of fluctuation can be uh, converted to a diffusion coefficient, which in turn, through the Stokes-Einstein equation, can be converted to a radius RH, the hydrodynamic radius. There are two ways of analyzing dynamic light scattering. One is the cumulant analysis, which will give you an average radius and a measure of polydispersity. And the second is the regularization analysis, which will actually give you a quasi-distribution of sizes across that entire range without fractionation, which is really powerful. It's not as accurate or as quantitative as using fractionation, but uh, in many cases, this is really useful and important. And a brief example of the kind of regularization results that you can see, here's a mixture of BSA and polystyrene spheres. Um, if you measure them indiv individually, you'd see the BSA peak over here at about uh, four nanometers. You'd see the polystyrene spheres over here at about 50 nanometers. And if you mix them together, you can see these distinct peaks in the green. Um, you'll notice that the size scale over here is logarithmic, and that's a good indication of the kind of resolution that you can get in terms of size with dynamic light scattering. In fact, in order to uh, differentiate populations, their physical radius needs to uh, differ by about a factor of three to five in order to actually see distinct peaks. So it's not a high resolution technique, but it is very quick and easy to use in order to look in particular at these larger aggregates. The average RH that you can measure, on the other hand, can be pretty accurate. So the, the position of this peak to within one or two percent, and that can give you an indication of the presence of small ligamers. So how do we screen formulation buffers for aggregation? Well, here's a, a quick example of just looking at a few different conditions that can be set up on the plate reader to understand the impact of formulation on monoclonal antibody aggregation. I should note that light scattering is highly sensitive to aggregates, and that's because the scattered intensity is proportional to the product of the molecular weight times concentration, uh, and that is proportional to the sixth power of the radius times the number of particles. And so it's very, very heavily weighted towards the larger aggregates, the, the, the small uh, intensities that you see over here. I'm sorry, the, the, the relatively large intensities that you see over here of these large aggregates, around 100 nanometers, correspond to very, very small amounts of, aggreg of, of aggregates in terms of numbers and uh, concentration. And so this, this example shows um, uh, a monoclonal antibody 
uh, in a PBS buffer and in a 2% sucrose buffer, buffer pre and post lyophilization, all loaded up on the plate reader in four individual wells and in multiple uh, replicates. And you can see, in fact, the impact of the sucrose on the, uh, on the additional aggregates. Uh, in fact, where we have post lyophilization, the PBS buffer, which is the green over here, has some really large aggregates. The sucrose buffer has more of the smaller aggregates, but fewer of the larger aggregates. So that's the kind of information that you can get just by loading them up onto the dynamic light scattering plate reader and uh, pressing go, basically, and coming up with these distributions. And here's an example of how you can set up the software to give you a quick visualization. So the dynamic software, which runs the uh, dynamic light scattering plate reader, can be set up to for a, uh, a, a thermal map, which you see here, where the red uh, wells are coded to indicate nice monodisperse um, solutions. Uh, in this example, though you may not be able to see the values, this is about five nanometers, and that's a, so that's basically a, a uh, uh, monomeric protein. The blue wells have been color coded to indicate those with moderate degrees of aggregation, and the black wells are the black holes, where basically you have these micron size aggregates, uh, non soluble and precipitating. And so this is nice, again, you can load this up. This takes less than an hour to run. And in the end, you get this nice visual map, which will give you a quick indication of uh, which formulations are worth proceeding with. Once you've gone through that initial indicator, you might want to look at some more uh, nuanced uh, analyses to assess the propensity for aggregation. And that's typically done by looking at combination of thermal stability and colloidal stability. Thermal stability is assessed through a temperature ramp, and colloidal stability is assessed through a concentration gradient uh, in order to determine the D1 parameter. Something which I'll get to later on in my talk is how the same information can be used to determine the effect of the conformational change on the protein-protein interactions, which lead to instability. And another thing that is nice to do with the, uh, with the uh, thermal ramp, which I haven't done in the examples I show you, but it's a great thing to try at home, is a measure of reversibility. So if you ramp up and you see some aggregation, ramp back down, has that now reverted to the original condition or not? And so what we see here is a, a graph of monoclonal antibody one under one condition, condition one. And what we see is a series of concentrations between half a mg per mil and up to 15 mg per mil. And up to about 56 degrees, everything is in a nice small size, so there's no aggregation. Um, and then past about 56 degrees, you get this massive change in size. You can see that the ch sizes are going into the hundreds of nanometers, so that's really large aggregates. And another interesting thing to note is that the uh, intermediate period here between about uh, 61 degrees and, uh, and 72 degrees uh, sees uh, kind of a flat, no change in size. So it's reached some final aggregation state, which does depend on concentration, but it's not increasing further with temperature until you reach the secondary transition, which is another unfolding transition that leads to aggregation. If we zoom in on this region over here, that's the graph up here. Um, you can see that the temperature at which you begin to see this increase in size actually depends on concentration. So the higher concentration starts out earlier, starts rising in size earlier. Uh, the lowest concentrations rise in size later on. Um, there are a couple possible interpretations for that. It could be just a kinetic effect in terms of more collisions because of higher concentration and leading to uh, more aggregation. Um, another possible interpretation is the colloidal interactions between those aggregates. And again, we'll get back to this uh, later on in the talk to examine more deeply what is behind this concentration dependence. This is the same monoclonal antibody in a different condition. Um, and here you can see that there is still a, uh, an aggregation point, but the behavior is quite different. It uh, settles at a much smaller size. Instead of hundreds of nanometers, we're up in the range of 15 to 20. Uh, again, there is a, uh, uh, a dependence on concentration. So if you look at the, uh, the midpoint temperature for this, uh, it changes somewhat with concentration. And we'll be looking at this again more closely to understand what it means. This is a, a, a small aggregate. I won't show you in, in this uh, talk, but it is possible in principle to use the information from dynamic light scattering to understand the average oligomeric state as well as the size of the aggregate.
that epiglide scattering gives you more information besides just the fact that you have a thermal transition. And so as you saw earlier, you can look at the size. And if we were to pick one of those final temperatures where there is aggregation, we can actually zoom in and determine the distribution of aggregate sizes. And so for condition one, which had the massive aggregation, you can see that we have a lot of uh, really large aggregates, a population centered around 73 nanometers, and one around 1100 nanometers, which is basically uh, crashing out of solution. If you were to use other techniques based on fluorescence or calorimetry, you might have picked up on the fact that this is crashing out of solution. You wouldn't have a good idea of what was forming. Uh, on the other hand, condition two, which gave these nice stable aggregates, not too large, they provide a distinct uh, population centered at 18 and a half nanometers, obviously not crashing out of solution. And so DSC or DSF would not give an indication that past that thermal transition, there's actually this aggregation going on. So dynamic light scattering gives you lots of critical information in this screens. Before I go on to colloidal stability, I'd like to just give you a little bit of uh, theoretical background on uh, the origins of colloidal stability or instability. So put two proteins in solution, uh, and there are different types of interactions between them. Uh, these are two molecules of the same uh, protein in this case. So the first order interaction is simply the excluded volume, which is the hardcore repulsion. That's always there because proteins will always have uh, this property that they can't penetrate each other very much. And that uh, actually impacts the light scattering. Uh, the next order of interaction between them tends to be the net charge interaction. And so in this case, we can see that these proteins have three pluses scattered around them and one minus. So they have a positive net charge, and therefore they repel each other. Um, if they were different types of proteins, they might be uh, repulsive or, interact or attractive, depending on their specific net charges. There are also dipoles and charge inhomogeneities that will generally cause an attraction. So for instance, we see that um, the orientations in solution of these proteins have settled out. So that the more negative, more positive side of this protein is attracted to the more negative side of this protein, and that causes an attraction. There are also lo local dipoles, hydrophobic patches, hydrogen bonds, all these other things that generally are attractive. So all of these different uh, interactions come together in order to generate the overall net interaction, which is what we'll be looking at shortly. Now, often those net nonspecific interactions are quanti quantified using second Virial coefficient, but in fact, dynamic light scattering can be used to determine a related measure of uh, nonspecific interaction which is the uh, diffusion interaction parameter. And that's measured simply by uh, taking the diffusion coefficient as a function of concentration. There, in this particular example, there's a uh, increase in diffusion coefficient. That will indicate repulsion. That's the sign of D1 over here. And if there's an attraction, then we'll see a decrease in diffusion coefficient. Uh, and that will come up in the slope D1 as well. It has been shown uh, that at least for uh, identical, similar classes of proteins, for instance, monoclonal antibodies, um, there is a very direct correlation between second viral coefficient, which is typically measured with static light scattering, requires more sample and is a, not a high throughput technique, and D1, the, uh, the interaction parameter determined from dynamic light scattering. And so if you measure D1, there is a direct correlation to A2, uh, which is a pure thermodynamic inter uh, parameter. This is the correlation. And going back to our protein under two different conditions, uh, the D1 for condition one was minus 18, which means that it is self-attractive. And for D1 is minus 10, which means that it too is self-attractive, but not as much as, con as condition one. And so condition two has better colloidal stability under these conditions. Uh, this is simple to set up and run. You just basically have to titrate a few different concentrations into the wells. You can easily set up a few replicates and off you go. A few more screening applications that you can use with the DLS plate reader are conformational stability by chemical denaturation. And so here you're titrating in different amounts of urea and looking at the unfolding as a function of the uh, concentration of the denaturant. Uh, and in this example from uh, you et al., they looked at, at a protein which was unfolding in various stages. So there are multiple domains, and each domain had its own individual unfolding point. And from this, you can actually extract the delta G, the free energy of unfolding. Another good measure of conformational stability. And then I mentioned that you can measure viscosity. So interestingly enough, you, normally when you do dynamic light scattering, you're, you're measuring the property of your solute, 
through its diffusion coefficient, and you need, to, you need to know the viscosity of the solution in order to determine the apparent size. In order to measure the viscosity of a solution, we turn this around. And if we're looking at, for instance, at a concentrated monoclonal antibody, we're not going to look at the light scattering from the antibody. We're going to spike in some large polystyrene latex beads or gold beads or other types of known entities which have stronger light scattering signal than the protein and are very distinct in terms of size. And we're going to turn around the equation, uh, the Stokes-Einstein equation over here. So if we know the radius of the beads and we measure the diffusion coefficient and we know the temperature, we can extract the radius. If we were to plot the apparent radius of the bead as a function of viscosity, we would see that as the viscosity increases, the apparent radius uh, increases, and that ratio will just give us the specific viscosity of the solution. In this graph, we're looking at a comparison of some viscosity values measured by dynamic light scattering with uh, standard viscometry uh, for a monoclonal antibody up to about 140 mix per mil. And you can see that there's a very nice correlation. Um, I wouldn't personally recommend that you absolutely rely on dynamic light scattering as a definitive measure of, vis of viscosity, uh, but it does uh, correlate well and collaborate well uh, with, uh, uh, with standard measurements. It trends in the same way, so increasing viscosity in standard viscometry will show up as increasing viscosity in DLS, and it's a great way for doing high throughput screening um, uh, independently of uh, other assumptions that you need to make. So to summarize, the first stage, which is running through a matrix of formulations or perhaps candidates, dynamic light scattering plate reader gives you lots of information simultaneously. You can measure the aggregation state and get a size distribution. Uh, you can measure the thermal conformation through uh, the transitions in size. You can identify unfolding as well as aggregation. Um, you can measure D1 for colloidal stability measure the chemical denaturation to get the delta G, and you can even measure viscosity. And as I mentioned earlier, not just for proteins, all types of biotherapeutics have been um, measured and characterized in the formulation stage uh, via the dynamic light scattering plate reader. The next stage is the accelerated and shelf life stability studies. And so the primary tool there will be SEC models, which couple standard size exclusion chromatography uh, with a uh, uh, Don Helio Smalls detector, multi-angle light scattering, and usually you'll add in a refractive index detector, the OptiLab, for concentration analysis. Um, you can embed in the Malls detector dynamic light scattering module uh, in order to measure dynamic light scattering in size in the same volume, in the same cell as uh, static light scattering, and you use the UV detector from the liquid chromatography system. If you need to run uh, more rapid separations, if you need to use smaller sample sizes, then you can go to UHPLC, and there uh, the uh, corresponding uh, MALS detector would be the Microdon, and the corresponding refractive index detector would be the UTREx. If you need to also extend your measurements beyond those of, beyond the size range of standard size exclusion, or if you have issues due to interactions with the column, you can apply an additional separation technique called field fractionation, which is implemented using the CLIPS. And that allows you to do separation of nanoparticles and insoluble aggregates up to over 1,000 nanometers. It's also a nice low shear technique. So if your aggregates are delicate and might dissociate uh, upon running through the column, a field fractionation does not apply that shear, and you can measure them intact. Properties that are measured are, first of all, the absolute molecular weight and size distributions. As I mentioned earlier, multi-angle light scattering does not depend on things like elution time or uh, molecular standards in order to assess molecular weight. It's an absolute first principles measurement. So you can get those distributions of molecular weight and size uh, over a very large range from 200 Daltons all the way up to hundreds of millions of Daltons. You can measure the root mean square radius from 10 nanometer up to hundreds of nanometers, uh, the hydrodynamic radius using the integrated dynamic light scattering detector from half a nanometer up to uh, hundreds of nanometers. In order to characterize small aggregates and ligamers, you can characterize protein conjugates, such as glycoproteins or pegylated proteins. And by combining the, the information from the MALS and the DLS, you can assess conformation. So just briefly how multi-angle light scattering works, the scattered intensity is proportional to the product of molecular weight, the weight concentration, 
and the uh, the square of the uh, differential refractive index DNC, DNDC. And DNDC is, uh, is a known constant for most proteins in most solutions and can be measured for other, pro for other molecules. The, the size is determined via the angular dependence. Small molecules tend to be scattering equally in all directions, whereas larger particles have anisotropic scattering, and that's analyzed to assess the size. So first of all, application of, of SEC models for small aggregates, fragments, and protein conjugates. As I mentioned earlier, light scattering is really sensitive to aggregates. And so here's an example of a chromatogram of size exclusion. Um, the blue trace here is the concentration, and the red is the light scattering. And this peak over here uh, is actually corresponding to large aggregates in very small quantities, too small to show up in the concentration signal, but they do show up in the light scattering signal, and it's a good way of identifying those small amounts of larger aggregates. You can also identify fragments, and this is an example of doing a, a, a UHPLC separation with the microdon. Here is the uh, monomer of the IgG, and these are the various fragments. When you use the refractive index detector to uh, determine the concentration and measure the molecular weight with uh, moles, you don't need to know what these particular species of protein are, and so we can measure their molecular weights independently of knowing their extinction coefficient. We can also utilize the same information to determine the extinction coefficient, and that will help us identify these fragments in terms of being a monomeric antibody, the, a dimeric heavy chain, single heavy chain, and a light chain. You get, and again, you get really nice separations on UHPLC, and here we're looking at uh, aggregates of the IgG. You'll notice that this is a relative scale where the monomer is set to be one, and so we're looking at um, uh, aggregates which are less than 1% of the total height. And you can see really nice separation of these aggregates, as well as this higher uh, peak up here, larger molecular weight peak. If we zoom in on the aggregates, we can identify the molecular weights and identify them as, uh, as dimer of the monomer, a dimer of the double heavy chain, and so forth. Finally, by combining three detectors, the UV, refractive index, and light scattering, we can analyze protein conjugates, and that determines directly the molecular weight of the protein in the complex, the molecular weight of the, of the uh, modifier, which in this case is a glycan, and combining those two, we get the total molecular weight. If we look at the, uh, the, the product after application of stress, we can see the aggregates that have formed, and we can see that there really is no, for instance, in this case, stripping away of the modifier. Uh, these, all these peaks have constant ratios of protein to glycan, and so um, there has been no chemical change, even though there has been some aggregation. If you need to go to the higher order aggregates and larger species, FFF moles is really a, a good way to do that. It also eliminates column interactions. And one of the nice things about FFF moles is that it is a tunable separation technique, and you can tune it simply by changing the flow parameters. And in this case, the FFF has been tuned to zoom in and give you high resolution of uh, monomer, dimer, trimer, tetramer, etc. Uh, you can also tune it very readily to zoom out over a large uh, separation range. And here we can see the monomer as well as these aggregates that extend, extend up into the tens of millions of, uh, of grams per mole. And so it's a, a really a valuable technique when you need to look at these larger aggregates. Uh, SEC, uh, sorry, FFF in general does have the same, can, can achieve the same resolution, sometimes better than SEC, and has its much larger range of applicability. So while it is a somewhat more learning intensive technique to utilize, it, it is more powerful in many ways. Finally, if you've done a size screws and separation, and maybe also an FFF separation to look at the aggregates, you have some questions to validate those that information. So one thing that could happen uh, if you do size exclusion is that the aggregates are filtered out by the column. They might also break up due to shear on the column. They might also break up due to the dilution, which is inherent to chromatography, to size exclusion chromatography. In field flow fractionation, you don't have that filtering uh, property and you don't have that shear property to, to eliminate the larger aggregates, but you do you still have dilution, very similar to size exclusion chromatography. Um, and so if you want to validate that those chromatograms or fractograms have given you all of the aggregates, or perhaps you've lost some along the way, uh, an, uh, an orthogonal technique to do that validation is uh, batch malls or composition gradient malls, in this case, 
where you uh, do not do a, a separation. Uh, this is just a dilution series uh, around the formulation concentration. And in that series of injections, you measure the refractive index and the light scattering uh, and calculate the molecular weight. And you can see that the molecular weight here uh, is pretty close across the different concentrations, so not much change. And you can compare that to the weight average molecular weight that you get by integrating the chromatogram or the fractogram and then see if you've lost any aggregates along the way. So this is a good way of doing validation. Uh, to summarize this part, which is the accelerator and shelf life stability studies, uh, where you're going to be extracting aliquots, running them through SEC malls, perhaps microsec malls or FFF malls, you'll be able to assess the aggregation and fragmentation, other types of degradation, uh, which will give you a quantitative analysis beyond percent monomer, which is what you typically do with uh, simple SEC. Uh, assess the post-translational modifications and how they might have changed due to stress conditions. If you need to do accelerated stability studies and, and extract um, uh, more frequently in order to get a higher frequency of, uh, of uh, time points, you can do microsec malls using UHPLC. FFF malls will extend, your, extend the range of characterization to large and insoluble aggregates. And it's also useful for uh, species that may not be amenable to SEC separation, uh, nanomedicines, VLPs, liposomes, and so forth. And CG models, which stands for composition gradient multi-angle light scattering, will help you validate the chromatograms or fractograms to, to determine if you've lost aggregates due to the separation uh, handling. Now you've gone through a variety of formulations and you've seen certain types of behavior and you want to understand them better. So what is really causing, what's behind behavior that you see? Well, we'll have a couple more light scattering uh, systems that will help us do those analyses. The first is comp composition gradient multi-angle light scattering. Which utilizes the Calypso system, that's this box over here, which is basically a, a composition gradient system which creates uh, mixtures of up to three different solutions and injects them into the standard detectors, which are the MALS detector and, and uh, concentration detector. And combined with the uh, software that operates this and does the analysis, in general, this is a system for label-free and mobilization-free uh, analyses of biomolecular interactions. And I won't go through this too much because we're going to focus, uh, for purposes of formulation, only on a couple of types of interactions that this can analyze. Uh, the properties that are measured are the affinity, the stoichiometry, for instance, which aggregates form or which self-association states form, uh, reaction rates, and second viral coefficient, which is a measure of nonspecific interactions. Another tool that can be used in the interpretation of the interactions is the Mobius, uh, which is an electrophoretic mobility detector. It measures zeta potential and net charge on molecules, as well as size and size distributions because it incorporates your ba uh, basic dynamic light scattering detector as well. Some of the nice properties of the Mobius in particular as a, a zeta potential detector is that it's compatible with auto samplers, so you can load up samples and let it run overnight. It uh, is highly sensitive and can work with low applied voltage so that you don't fry your samples. And you can also incorporate the Atlas pressurization system, which is useful in overcoming the, uh, the bubbles that form during electrophoresis and interfere with the measurement. Key applications of Mobius would be measuring PI in native solution and understanding the impacts of or the contributions of the net charge or zeta potential to colloidal stability and possibly identifying chemical degradation as well if that degradation causes a change in the net charge of the molecule. So the first application that we'll look at will be nonspecific self and co-solute interactions. Just to remind you, colloidal instability is due to all these different uh, nonspecific interactions on the on the molecules. And typically what you do in order to measure the nonspecific interactions is second viral coefficient, often measured using, using multi-angle light scattering. And the behavior is such that if you increase the concentration, the light scattering intensity will increase linearly if you have an A2 value of zero, which I won't go into it too deeply, but actually indicates that there is some, uh, a small de some degree of attraction between the molecules. Uh, if you have larger attraction, you'll see a negative A2. You'll see a super linear dependence of light scattering intensity on concentration. If you have a sublinear dependence, that's a positive A2. That indicates net repulsion. And for many proteins, at least, being compact and other types of compact biomolecules, the uh, excluded volume 
a value of A2, which can be calculated if you know its hydrodynamic radius, is a good reference baseline. So if you turn off all of the various types of interactions uh, and are left just with the excluded volume interaction, this is the uh, value that you can calculate for A2. Quick example of how A2 can be used to assess solvent conditions. Uh, interactions tend to be mediated by the buffer and depend on the buffer composition. And you can look at how A2 varies with pH, for instance, in order to understand the impact of the electrostatics, which change under different pH. So here's a protein. This is actually BSA, and we've measured uh, A2 as a function of pH. And you can see that it reaches a minimum. And this minimum actually corresponds to PI. That's a good indicator that the dominant interaction here is uh, the net repulsion due to the electrostatics, which change uh, in the vicinity of, via, of PI. Uh, as you go away from PI, there's a higher net charge and more self-repulsion. Uh, you can go a little bit deeper. So what does the actual value, actual measured value of A2 tell you? Well. If you, if you know the uh, hydrodynamic radius of the molecule, you can calculate the A2 that would be expected due to just the hardcore repulsion. The measured A2 is lower than that, indicating that at PI, where you get rid of net charge, there are other things going on. There are other net attractive interactions. And so under, uh, under this condition, even though A2 is somewhat positive, the actual interactions are attractive. If the behavior of A2 with pH were different, that might indicate that there are other things that, are, that dominate the interactions. For instance, if the maximum A2 occurred at PI, that might be an indication that the uh, charge inhomogeneity is the key dominant interaction. And if it has nothing to do with PI, then that might actually indicate that hydrophobics or something else is dominating. So we looked at how to measure the self-interaction using light scattering. Turns out you can also use light scattering to measure the cross interaction. So if you mix two co-solutes, the net light scattering will depend on the self-interaction of A, the self-interaction of B, and also on the cross interaction between them. Uh, and we'll denote that A11 as the cross real coefficient, which quantifies cross interactions between co-solutes. This is characterized here. And so what we've done is look at a series of measurements. Uh, the first section over here is a protein concentration as a function uh, of, of just protein A, here lysozyme, and that lets us analyze its self-interactions. This is a concentration series in protein B alone, which lets us analyze its self-interactions. And finally here, we have a mixture under various stoichiometric ratios, a look at the change in light scattering. And by analyzing these data using the previous equation, you can understand the cross interactions between these proteins. And in this particular case, we found that lysozyme is self-attractive, BSA is self-repulsive, and the BSA and lysozyme attract each other, um, not uh, surprisingly, because this is taken at pH 7. BSA and lysozyme have their PAs, PIs on opposite side of pH 7. And so in this case, they have opposite charges and are self-attractive. So this is a nice way of looking at interactions uh, between co-solutes, which might be uh, different antigens in a, in a vaccine, might be different antibodies in a, co in a cocktail. Another way of using uh, CG malls is to look at reversible self-association. And so for reversible self-association, we look at a concentration series and measure the change in the apparent molecular weight as a function of concentration. If there is self-association, we'll have formation of dimers or trimers or something else, and we'll see an increase in the apparent molecular weight of the solution. Uh, this is accomplished using the system I described earlier the Calypso comp Composition Gradient System, and our standard light scattering detectors. And when you're at relatively low concentrations, um, you can distinguish between cases where you have no interaction and cases where you have formation of dimer, trimer with different KDs. So you can fit these data to models and determine the uh, correct model that fits the data, what is the stoichiometry, and what is the KD. When you go to really high concentrations, which are in the range of, say, um, tens or hundreds of uh, uh, grams per milliliter. Light scattering can do funny things. Uh, you can see that uh, while you normally expect the light scattering to increase in concentration, at some point it actually starts decreasing. This is an effect of the repulsive interactions between the molecules. Uh, I won't describe this too much, but again, we can analyze the data in order to determine what's happening. Do we have dimer formation? What is the KD? Do we have some other type of self-association? This self-association is really important for certain biotherapeutics, for instance, insulin and its analogs, where the association state is important for the stability and efficacy of this therapeutic.
Um, and so while in the presence of zinc, we all know that insulin forms hexamers, in the absence of zinc, uh, it's kind of a question what it does. It does self-associate. And here we see a change in the apparent molecular weight as a function of concentration. This can be analyzed using the Calypso software. And it turns out that the model that best fits the data is an isodesmic association model, which means that we have the formation of dimer and trimer and tetramer and pentamer and so forth. With a KD of 52 micromolar for each new monomer joining this growing cluster. And so this is a, a really uh, quick and effective way to measure that self-association, which is so important for insulin formulation. Another way that CGMALS is used often to look at self-association is high con highly concentrated monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and uh, often there is a connection between the uh, self-interactions and the viscosity, which is uh, deleterious to those formulations. This is an example of, a, of an antibody under a few different conditions. And under this condition, where the, there was very little change in apparent molecular weight, that correlated well to a low viscosity. Whereas, whereas there is a larger degree of self-association that correlates to higher viscosity. And this is an indication that the interactions between the antibodies corresponds to the formation of some type of a network or large loose clusters. Those, those interactions will lead to higher viscosity. Uh, in other cases, you might actually see a lower viscosity corresponding to more interaction. And that would be a good indication of a formation of tight uh, aggregates because when the antibodies form tighter complexes, that will actually decrease the viscosity. And finally, I'd like to look at how dynamic light scattering can use to understand the thermally induced conformational changes. So going back to this example, antibody one in condition two, we saw a concentration dependence to the thermal ramp, uh, which indicated aggregation uh, past a, per a particular melting point. And we can calculate that D1 parameter, which is these uh, blue points as a function of temperature. So what we plotted here in blue is D1. Uh, and you'll notice that I've inverted the scale. So more negative, uh, higher on the scale means more attractive. The black line is the hydrodynamic radius of the smallest molecules. Uh, and so you can see that there is a, a change in size right around 55. But there's a change in the interaction which occurs earlier on. So earlier on at a lower temperature, there's more interact, more self-association, even though there's no change in size. And so we can understand that by assuming that there is a small conformational change, which I've kind of cartoonishly descri uh, described over here. It's a small conformational change, which doesn't result in a change of size, but it does expose some type of aggregation hotspot or some type of interactive hotspot, which causes the increase uh, of the self-association. Then once you, you actually have a change in size, and this is opening up, now you can have aggregation, uh, which is shown over here. And once you have aggregation, those hotspots are now hidden from the other molecules, and you actually see a decrease over here uh, in the D1 until it finally saturates at uh, some specific value when the aggregates have saturated. So this is a good way of looking at what is the impact of the conformational change. If we zoom in, let me zoom in on that. So here it is zoomed in. You can see that there's actually about two or three degree difference between where we see the onset of the interaction, which indicates a small conformational change, and where we see the change in RH, which is a larger conformational change. Um, dynamic light scattering gives us additional information, which is the uh, count rate, which is actually a form of static light scattering, and can be interpreted to give us a qualitative measure of actual aggregation, not just change in size, but change in molecular weight. And if we zoom in on this region over here, we can see actually three uh, different transition temperatures. Uh, the transition temperature for D1, where we see the onset of interactions. The transition temperature for RH, where we see unfolding. And finally, aggregation. And the transition temperature for the count rate, which is static light scattering and tells us that we have actual change in molecular weight. So there's a lot of information there. When we delve into this final step, which is better understanding the, the underlying interactions, underlying processes that impact the formulation, um, CGMOL, CG dynamic light scattering, CGDLS, and electrophoretic light scattering uh, allow us to examine the biomolecular self-associations, which are important for insulin and its analogs, quantitatively characterize protein interactions at high concentrations, measure the interactions between co-solutes, which might be micelles of surfactants, might be a multivalent vaccine, um, 
The propensity for aggregation, which is the contribution of the net charge to the colloidal stability, as well as D1. Uh, D1, as a function of temperature, highlights those processes which occur below the onset of aggregation and indicate the consequence of the conformational change. Uh, and I haven't given you examples, but certainly if there are changes in net charge due to chemical modifications, those will also be picked up by, uh, by uh, electrophoretic light scattering. And so I won't walk you through this entire slide. It's just kind of a summary of all the things that we've looked up till now, how the different light scattering tools fit together to uh, uh, address and attack the different stages of formulation in order to characterize and analyze and screen the biophysical properties of the therapeutic under the different conditions before stress, after stress, during stress, uh, and uh, finally come up with the final successful formulation. Uh, if you would like more information, I invite you to email me or to visit our website. We have uh, uh, various additional webinars which can be used to, uh, you can view them and learn more about the specific techniques, uh, learn more about SCC models, uh, visit our library which is full of application notes and white papers. And so with that, I thank you for attention and I'll turn it back to Elizabeth. Any questions? Okay, we have quite a few questions. One of the first questions that came in was, how can I trace polymer synthesis? Okay, so well, tracing, I'm not sure what tracing means, but I'm going to assume that it means monitoring uh, the synthesis of the polymers. So there are two ways to do this, and it depends somewhat on how quickly that polymerization reaction is happening. Um, and um, if it's a slow reaction, typically what you do is you extract aliquots at different points uh, along the way, run it through size exclusion chromatography, so SEC, SEC with multi-angle light scattering and measure the change in the distributions of the polymers. Um, typical GPC takes about half an hour to run. Um, you can run uh, APC, which is the Waters uh, system for uh, advanced polymer characterization, which is a shorter run, can be a couple minutes. So it kind of depends on the time scale. Um, if, you're, if you do not want that degree of information, a uh, simple way for monitoring polymerization is just to run the unseparated material through a multi-angle light scattering concentration detector. That will give you the weight average molecular weight of a polymer solution. And so that can be monitored on a very quick time scale as well, in the order of seconds. Okay. How can one verify that a conformational change or change in RH is significant? <laughs> well, significant. If you have pretty good solutions, you have relatively clean solutions and do a good measurement, you can monitor changes in, in RH on the order of one or 2%. And so you make multiple measurements and you, you know, the usual science, which is what is the uh, standard deviation of your measurements and how significant is it? Um, in terms of the significance of the impact on the formulation though, again, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, D1, the, uh, the, um, uh, in, the interaction parameter that you measure with dynamic light scattering uh, and changes in that will give you a better indication of the impact on the formulation. If that change causes additional repulsion, if it causes additional attraction, if it causes aggregation. So those are the two aspects of this uh, measurement that I think can be looked at in different ways. Okay. Can you analyze a very small protein, roughly six kilodaltons, using this methodology? Uh, certainly. So that's about the size of insulin. And um, all these instruments have been measured, have been used to characterize insulin. Um, and you can go smaller in size as well. For insulin, it's typically used to look at the self-association states of insulin with a plate reader. With uh, multi-angle light scattering, as I mentioned, you can go down to 200 Daltons. So, um, you know, uh, you can look at the monomers and the aggregates, um, self-association of insulin with multi-angle light scattering as well. Do you have the capability of determining the molecular weight if you have two separate peaks using DLS? So DLS doesn't actually determine molecular weight. Um, it determines size. Um, and there... You know, any conversion between size and molecular weight depends on certain assumptions. So even if you have just one peak, um, that is not uh, a direct measurement of molecular weight. If you have two peaks, uh, all the less. <laughs> so whatever model you use to, to convert from size to molecular weight, uh, 
uh, you can apply to both peaks and you can come up with approximately the same uh, degree of uh, confidence, but neither one of them is really a good, uh, ha has a high degree of confidence because it depends on the model that you assume. Ah, okay. Can you do the self-association and cross-interaction analysis on batch mode SLS measurements without using a Calypso? Well, you can do it manually. So you can uh, prepare the different mixtures. You can either inject into the flow cell or you can use a, a microcovette uh, and do the measurement microcovette. The disadvantage is clear in that you're, you're, there tends to be operator error in making up lots of different concentrations. It is possible to collect the data. Um, the other aspect of that is the analysis. So um, the Clips of software is used to do the analysis of cross viral coefficients. Um, the other software that we have for collecting batch data is Astra. It can analyze uh, second viral coefficient, but it cannot analyze uh, self-association states or cross-viral interactions. Okay. We have several questions around the, the capability of the unit. What concentration range can be used in DLS using Dynapro 2? Concentration range depends on the molecular weight. Uh, and so the minimum concentration for measuring lysozyme, for instance, is 0 0.15 mix per mil. Um, lysozyme has a molecular weight of about 100, uh, 14, sorry, 14 point, uh, point six or 0.5 um, uh, kilodaltons. And so the, uh, the, the sensitivity is inversely proportional to molecular weight. If you go to a monoclonal antibody, which has 10 times the, con the molecular weight, you can go to one-tenth the concentration, which would be 15 micrograms per milliliter. Okay, and a, a somewhat related question. What are the viscosity and concentration limits for analysis of self-association measured using CG models? Um, so with the Clipso 2, the, the limit of what you can pump through the system is um, uh, viscosity of about six or seven centipoise. Um, the con there, there's really no concentration limit. It depends on the viscosity. If you do have those issues with viscosity and can't use the, uh, the Calypso to, to generate the mixtures and inject into the light scanning detector, you have another option, which is to prepare your own solutions um, use the uh, use a micro uh, to make the measurements and use the Clips of software to do the analysis, to collect the data and do the analysis. Okay, and we have time for just one other question also related. What is the lowest concentration of target proteins that can be detected for aggregation? Again, that's a function of, uh, of, uh, of molecular weight. Um, and so... Uh, if you're if you're looking at something on the order of uh, you know many tens of millions of Daltons or hundreds of millions aggregates which are up in the in the hundreds of nanometer range, those are really really small concentrations. We're talking about well below micrograms per milliliter. Um, so it's all this proportionality. Uh, you we take you take the sensitivity for for lysozyme, which is uh, 150 micrograms per milliliter figure out the ratio of molecular weight, and divide by that to get your sensitivity in terms of larger aggregates. Okay, and with a minute left, one more. Does SecMOLS or DLS take into consideration the actual shape of the macromolecule? In other words, does it assume the molecule to be globular? So SecMOLS, and multi-angle ice scattering in general, does not make any assumption in terms of the conformation. Uh, you, it measures molecular weight independently of conformation. Uh, it will measure RG, the root mean square radius, uh, which again is something which is generally, um, well, uh, it, it does depend on the conformation because it's a measure of size. Dynamic light scattering measures the uh, diffusion coefficient, and it gives you a measure of size called the hydrodynamic radius, um, which is not a measure of molecular weight. If you want to convert that to molecular weight, you need to make an assumption about the, about the conformation. Um, the, the hydrodynamic radius is the equivalent, uh, sphere, is the radius of an equivalent sphere, which has the same diffusion coefficient as your molecule. And so the, the RH and the RG are two different measures of size, and actually you can use the ratio between them to get some indication of the conformation. Okay, perfect. And the timing is perfect as well. We're right up on the hour. I'd like to thank you so much, Dr. Sohm, for your presentation. I'd like to thank Wyatt Technology Corporation for sponsoring today's web event.
And most of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and spending some time with us. I hope you were able to get some information that will help you in your scientific endeavors. So with that, I'll say to everyone, have a great day. Bye-bye.